Well, glory be to God. Greetings to you. This is Apostle Max, and the podcast show is called Kingdom Keys. It's the place where we speak all things kingdom and bring the revelation of the kingdom of God. I think in one of my sessions, I actually mentioned uh, Mark uh, gave a wrong scripture around the mysteries of the kingdom. But Mark 4 and verse 11 says, to you it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. To everybody else, all things comes in parables. This is the beginning of my ministry. This is me spending time in the presence of God, knowing that I'm called by God to um, do something for the kingdom. And this is the only scripture God gave me, Mark 4, 11. And it frustrated me and it got me on the search, but it is exactly what the kingdom is all about. Because the Bible says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. And this is what the kingdom is all about. You go on the search, you make it your priority, you seek it first, and it becomes a really exciting journey. And this is where we are right now and what God is doing in and through our lives. And the revelation about how to pray and using the Our Father as the model that we're developing people in. And I know that there are testimonies coming through and there are breakthroughs, healings, deliverances, answers. And the greater thing that I'm hearing around the testimonies are people are building a confidence before God. And that's what it's about because it raises your expectation. And expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. So when you get into the kingdom of God and we build a man's belief system, he's able to walk with boldness and confidence before the throne room of God. And wherever they go, they, when they pray, they're finding results everywhere. Father, thank you today for your anointing, your grace, and your favor. Thank you for blessing the sons and daughters. Thank you for everybody across the globe. The transformation is taking place. We're trusting you for a tremendous prayer movement that will take place across the globe to impact people's lives, to bring real transformation and real results. And my God, to you belongs all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So there's been plenty that we've been giving in terms of revelation, but you're going to build an exciting prayer life. You're going to build strong foundations and you're going to find results in the workplace, in your body, in your family, people being saved, answers in our nation, answers in the governments, breakthrough finances. It's going to happen. It's happening because the kingdom has everything that you need to live a life of success. And so when the disciples asked him to pray, it's in Mark chapter uh, Matthew, I apologize. Ma Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 5 says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Your prayer is not for man. Your prayer is as unto God. That's the audience you want. That is who you want must hear your prayer. You're not yet to impress people because you know so many scriptures. That's not how you're going to get results. He says, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So that's also letting you know that every prayer brings with it a reward. But when you pray, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So there's a reward for prayer. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows you have need of the things you had need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So there are two um, really important models that I'm busy presenting to you and, and need you to put this into your spirit. One is to make sure that your belief system is right. So we are creating, uh, we've created these nine key things, these nine key points that you need to understand. And in fact, they divided into three. And we spoke about this as understanding the two worlds, the one world that's living in deception, Babylon, and uh, the father of lies that's controlling every demonic and satanic system. But you are representing a different kingdom, your father in heaven. So when you look at the model, 
of what we are busy with, you can number one, find that there's a boundary with God. Heaven belongs to God. You can't go into heaven. Satan can't control those heavens. You'll never be placed back in there. He was once in there. He knows what it's like. He can never return to heaven because that's the boundary. That's God's throne. That's his place. That's his home. That's his office. You don't come up there and th- with unrighteousness and think you can control life and people down here. It's not going to happen. There is a demonic realm that the enemy uses to try and control people. But there is another realm where God is positioned that he controls and we can approach that throne of grace. So number one is that there is heaven. And number two is that there is earth. This is the model. And of course, God gave you earth. The earth is given to the sons of men. And then there's eternity. And that's really important to understand. If you're going to build a solid prayer life, you need to make sure that you understand all of them. Many people don't believe that there's a devil. So what's the point of praying? There is another demonic. There's another world. It looks exactly like the world that God wanted, but it is actually a counterfeit because the devil is a deceiver. So he's built this world um, that he has deceiving people in the education system, in families and creating models. And it looks exactly like the kingdom of heaven, but it is actually a deception. Because he's a deceiver and the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Number one is that you found his boundary. Number two, you found God's intent. Now, this is an important place where we're going to go to today. Because there's the Father, there is the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God wanted sons in the earth to extend his kingdom in the earth. That you must understand. It's really important. And then, of course, the final one being that he is a king. He's also a judge and he's the lawgiver. We'll dig deeper into that. But attached to that is his word. Because where the word of the king is, there is power. And out of the power uh, of his word, out of the word, comes the power to bring real transformation in your world. So those are the nine key things that you need to understand to create and to build inside of you a solid belief system that your believing comes right. I say it again, right believing leads to right living. And if you get your belief system right, your life will come right because your prayer life will be right. What we're going to go into today, and we've been going down there a while already, we are dealing with something called the prayer grid. It is 12 stones of revelation. It's the revelation that Elijah got when he put on the 12 stones to raise an altar to deal with uh, the balls and to deal with um, idol worship. And I believe this is the season that we're in, that God is raising up an altar, but he's making sure that you understand the 12, which is governmental order, It is the 12 stones of revelation that you must, when you're presenting your prayer before God, you can dig deep with this. You can build a tremendous prayer life, an exciting prayer life as you present all these ideas. Uh, As we present you these ideas, it'll bring become revelation and you'll be able to dig into every one of them. And you'll pray for 20, 26 hours out of 24 because you're going to have so much revelation and the word of God is going to come alive and you're going to find results and it's going to become really exciting. So have a look at what we've done uh, with the Our Father. The Our Father, this is the revelation God's given us, is that you are dealing with uh, three main segments of the Our Father. I've divided it this way for the simplicity for you to understand. The first three that we've laid out in the the grid, uh, the first three things, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We've been focusing quite a bit on this one. This is the revelation of the fact that you need a relationship with your father. That's the place where you build relationship. So any kind of sin, any kind of things that's misaligned, anything that you got involved in, anything that is out of your father's will, any sin you got trapped in, any temptations, you first fix your relationship with God. Everybody type in there, please. Relationship first. When you're dealing with the Our Father, Jesus is bringing you into a place where there's no vain repetition and people, because of their plenty words, they think they're being heard. No, Jesus went to the very core, gave you the simplicity of the Our Father. And what is so powerful about this model is that your children can just learn the Our Father in your home. And then you can bring in deeper revelation on every single one of them and grow in your prayer life that will become so exciting even for your children to understand what God intended and what God wanted. wanted from the beginning of time. So you build a belief system to know that where God is in heaven, what what is needed on earth, and that he is your father. 
and that they, you can build a relationship with him. So uh, the first three is our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Everybody say relationships. The next six is where we're going to start on our next session. We're going to start tapping into the kingdom of God. The next six deals with the rules of engagement. You're going to have to start documenting and creating a journal about your prayer life. Because at the end, you're going to have for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Those are the results I get of my prayer life. I write down my testimonies in there. I begin to uh, document what God did for me. I'm reminded about certain dates. I preach about my testimonies. I speak about it over and over again because it's a documented proof that God answered my prayers and that his kingdom works. And this has been my lifestyle. I've been on this road 25 years with God. And I've got many testimonies of how God has come through for us, come through for the church, the certain dates, the testimonies. And that becomes then my proof or my track record in the spirit. Is because you're building your life and you laid a foundation. We're laying a foundation. This is the prayer grid. Every time I pray, this is what I'm expecting. And I go and remind when the devil says we're never coming through this one. I go back and I remind him through my, my, my track record and my journal that his is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. And this is my place where I honor him and I thank the Holy Spirit and I give God the king glory for his work, his word works. I begin to speak about it in my home, in my finances, in my body, the healing, the restoration. I speak about all those things because you must have a column of results. Why pray if you're not going to have results? I'm expecting God to answer you when you call because this is the power of God's kingdom. So as we get into this today, remember we will go into the rules and how to now engage with things on earth. Those are those six stones of revelation. What we are ending off now is this relationship part. And so our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy Spirit, help us. So having established all of that in the earth, uh, in your relationship with God. You, you're spending time in thanksgiving and praising God because you have a relationship with the creator of the universe who is also a king and has a royal family and you have access to his throne and you are washed in the blood of Jesus and he is your father. The revelation, people can speak about the man upstairs you should never refer to God anymore as the man upstairs or something, something told me. What is that? You are speaking to your father. He wanted a family and that was his plan and his plan still stands now forever. And this is why we sing when Jesus said, Hallowed be thy name. You hearing many people have names of God. Even from Jewish people to uh, the Muslim community. When people pray, did you know that there are 99 names for Allah, but not one is Father. Jesus came to reveal one name of God, Father. Father, my God. We can speak about Jehovah Jireh. We can speak about the redemptive names and we can speak about God's names and Jehovah Shalom is your peace. And we speak about that he's El El Yon, the most high God. And that's a beautiful, these are all names we can use. But as a, a born again believer coming into the kingdom of God, Jesus lets you know that I've come to reveal the father only. The one name of God that no other religion can claim. The Jews will call their father's Abba. And they would speak to a about Abraham as being their father of the faith. And he is. But there's nobody that can speak to him as God, our heavenly father. Do you understand the privilege? Do you understand the power? Do you understand the importance of this moment when you say, Hallowed be your name? You are my father. The father gave Jesus a name that is above every other name. That's not what I'm talking about. You ask the father in his name, but Jesus came to reveal the father. I am in John chapter 14, and I let us start in the beginning. Let not your heart be troubled. So Jesus is about to go. 
He's, they've seen his power. They've seen his ministry. They, they built relationship. He's about to go through the cross. And he's about to enter into a place uh, where he would not see them again. And they are so concerned. Because now what's going to happen to us? He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then he starts to make mention of this. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'd go to prepare a place for you. Now he's introducing not just the our father as a prayer. He's beginning to go deep and help you understand that my father's house, there are many mansions. He's speaking about the family. He's speaking about how the father treats him. And he begins to give up beautiful revelation. You must just go and read John chapter 14. It's so powerful, all about the revelation of the father. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only one that claimed that God is his Father. He's the only one that he says is making it abundantly clear. You can go and pray to any other God and you can go and, and, and you know, cut yourself and, and light candles and do all kinds of things. But if you are in the kingdom of God, you have a father. And I've come here to reveal my father to you. And the only way you can pray to the father is that you, you come through me. No man comes unto the father but by me. He never came here for himself. The whole revelation of Jesus coming was to open up the way to the father. It was all about the Father. It was all about this revelation about this name and this Father, this God of ours that cares for us like, like a father should. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Glory be to God. There's no confusion in heaven. The Father, the Son is here to reveal the Father. And the Holy Spirit is here to come and help you understand the Father. Because the Holy Spirit is the helper that comes from the Father. So he's three in one, but he's one God, right? But there's no confusion. And he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and eventually he'll be in you. Now he's in us. He was, with us, he was with them until Jesus was born, uh, until G Jesus died. And so when he got, came up from the grave, when he walked through the door, the first thing that he did when he met the disciples, he said, Phew. he breathed, breathed on them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed in them so they could receive the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit's not just amongst us, he's within us. Because I will not leave you orphans. Now that's an important conversation. Because the Holy Spirit is crying out, Abba, Father. It's bringing forth, your spirit is crying out. It's longing to be part of a family. This was God's design. I will come to you. So this whole prayer was about the Father, His kingdom. And the reason why Jesus came, it was the love of the Father. It was displaying God's love for you and me. It was about the Father's house. Jesus came and he said, I must be about my father's business. What was he studying? He was setting his belief system straight. Knowing that God had a boundary. Knowing that his father had a plan. He had a business plan. And he knew the, he wanted the authority of his word. That's all he started to build his belief system. That's all Jesus did. It was about bringing the father glory. You're going to start developing your relationship with God the Father and you're going to be, when you, you will be able to stay at this place called Hallowed Be Thy Name. I'm lifting up the name of my Father. You are the Most High God. You are a good, good Father. That's all Jesus came. He came to work out the plan of the Father for the earth. He stayed in relationship with the Father. But he knew that through the power of the Holy Spirit, there's no confusion. Everybody's here to do the same thing. is to bring glory to God is bring, to bring glory to our Father. It was that everyone that was plugged into this kingdom system is to bring pleasure or glory to the Father. John 15 verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified 
that you bear much fruit so you be my disciples so in the column of where thine is the kingdom the power and the glory that's my results of my prayer life that's a fruitful life it comes in that model because I, I now abide in him. His word abides in me. Now he says, now ask the Father in my name. If you ask it in Jesus' name, the Father's going to do it for you. Why? This is all about the Father. This is all about the family of God. This is all about the royal family we're speaking about. Come on. You are part of this royal family. You belong to the Most High God. And when he saved you, he brought you into a family. And he says, you are not even an orphan anymore. This was God's intention, and it hasn't changed. So when you come into uh, the kingdom of God and you begin to function out of this place, I want to speak to you about this adoption. He says, I will not leave you orphans. Now let's understand the importance of this orphan spirit. For me, I find it the most, it's, it's a really sad thing when I think about so many people that are struggling to fulfill the will of God for their lives. Because um, the orphan spirit, so people are saved, but they don't even believe that they belong to a family. They function like, like orphans. What is an orphan? Uh, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Please write this out. An orphan is number one without protection. An orphan, number two, is without protection provision an orphan number three is without a teacher an orphan number five is without a comforter an orphan is without a leader and yet when the holy spirit comes he's come to bring out your spirit crying out abba father that's what is working inside of you that you draw close to him that you have a relationship with your father so that you never feel like an orphan without protection without provision without guidance without leadership without comfort without strength this is what the enemy wants to make you th feel that way that's why when you're worshiping and you're building relationship with your father your heavenly father the first thing you do you stay there you build relationship you you stay in his presence you sing songs he's a good good father some of you need to go back to that place and begin to magnify him and not call him jehovah shalom and we we know he is don't call him jehovah jireh we know he is he is your father i please want you to know this because ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and 6 it says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us as to a uh, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. He's made us uh, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So I want you to know today that God adopted you. There's no parent that adopts a child that they don't want, because an adopted child is a wanted child. God wanted you. He chose you before the foundation of the earth. Now, what a glorious way to come and approach your heavenly father. Not with fear, um, not with uh, trepidation, not with uh, condemnation, not uh, feeling inferior. No, you're the righteousness of God. This is a royal family and you belong to the kingdom of God. Glory be to God. And so today, just declare this. Say, I am not rejected. I am accepted. I'm not abandoned. I am protected. Say this now and pray this out. I'm watched over. I'm provided for and I'm cared for. Others will abandon me. Even my mother and my father can forsake me. But God will never leave me, never forsake me. I belong to the Most High God. I will stay in, in your presence. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will worship and magnify him because he's not a God out there. He's my father. And I am not rejected and I'm not abandoned and I'm not by myself. I belong to the kingdom of God. The orphan spirit has been the derailing of many great destinies. I'm watching people, even though they got great gifts, they never come into what God has, the Father's got for them because they've never learned to stay in that place to say, hallowed be your name. Come on, somebody. I know the Father's care for me. He's a good, good father. 
Come on, say that. Put that in your spirit. Begin to develop that, that my father cares for me. I have a father who's in heaven and he cares for me. And I've come to worship him and thank him that there is a, this name that I have. It's he's my Abba. He's my daddy. So when you get into the kingdom of God and you begin to function, not as an orphan, but as a child of the Most High God, I now step into a place where I have such confidence, such confidence. I'm watching people fearful that when God tells them to jump, I remember my son when, you know, when he was much younger and you, he'd walk he's even my shoulders and we would just take walks and, and, and um, I would speak about him, his, his soccer game and I would encourage him and, and he trusted his father. And so there would be days I would put him just, you know, come home playing on the soccer fields, bring him and he's, he's so young, but he's standing on, uh, on, on maybe, you know, even younger than that just about learning to walk and to and to and to run a little bit then i'd put him on the table and then i would say come to dad and he would jump and i wouldn't even be looking properly and it's like i'm coming and he would just go for it that's a place of trust because of a relationship and there are many people that cannot jump into their destinies they don't move because number one they don't understand the importance of the relationship with the Father. What we're speaking about next is that there is a kingdom with the plan of the Father, His will for your life. And how easy that so few people are coming into what God has got for them. And I know it's not going to be you. You're coming and you're developing a belief system and a confidence and a trust in the voice of your Father, in the plan of, your, of God, and you're going to be able to jump in this next season and become what God has called you to be. That when God says, this is the woman to marry, you get married and God will supply and God will be there for you and God will make sure that you fulfill your destiny and your purpose. Glory be to God. So God is looking for sons in the earth, not just for your marriage, but to go into the nations and to represent him wherever you go. Glory be to God. Let's move forward with some things here and so that you can get some deeper revelation of what it is. Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. Hmm. Hallelujah. Let's get into this uh, thing around God being your father that uh, every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights. I want you to go and worship him with an expectation that he, you, you were created for fellowship, that he wants to speak to you, that he is your father. He wants to give you instruction. He wants to give you direction. He wants to bring you even correction because that is your father in heaven. And so when you magnify him and you worship him, you raise your expectation so that you can be found in his presence, delivering what you, what, expecting from him what you need for your life because that's your father. Have a look at James chapter 12 or James chapter 1. Let's go to verse from verse uh, 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. Someone said something really powerful. People into, enter into battles of temptation. We all get tempted, but not with evil. God will not never tempt you with evil. But any time you're in a constant battle with temptation is because you lack prayer. When you're praying, lead us not into temptation. If you're fighting battles of temptation over and over and over again, it's a sure sign you lack prayer. You're not praying. People that fall into temptation over and over again have got no prayer life. He says, when he's tempted, he says, I'm tempted by God. Uh, you, you can't be tempted and say, I, I'm te when you're tempted, I'm not tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. So if you're being tempted by evil, you know that you're lacking prayer. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away with his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin and to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. So there are things in our hearts that when you're dealing with your father, his desire comes on the inside of you. He flushes out any other desire. He will tell you, don't go in this direction. And not just that, he won't just tell you, it. he'll give you the grace and the strength to overcome in temptation. Can you see that? There's a connection between people that are prayerless and that are always falling into sin. It is not that the sin is not there and the temptation is not there. It's that people battle all the time because they lack prayer. So verse 16 says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. 
Here's verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You cannot tell me that God puts sickness on you, tempts you with evil, puts all kinds of stuff. What kind of father is that? You just don't have the right relationship with God, the father. Because God can never put any evil on you. He can never tempt you and cause you to fall. He's the one that's able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before his glorious presence. You stay in that place and you say, hallowed be thy name. You start to begin to call upon your father. You begin to worship him and begin to put into your spirit that he's your Abba. He's your father. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never cause you to stumble. He'll not put this, tempt you with evil. He can't. It's not in him to do that. I don't know how people blame God for the wicked stuff that they go through. And they're the things that the devil has done. And they blame their father. No, you serve, and type it out there. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. So when you come into the, the, his presence, you must expect only good because he's your, he's your father. Listen to Luke 20, 12, verse 32. Luke 12, 32. Do not fear, little flock. There should be no fear in you. Adam was afraid of God when he sinned. Sin should never keep you from the presence of God. You don't run, you, you know, uh, I saw that thing that is such a beautiful quote. Somebody said, you know, somebody that's in religion. Uh, one of the daughters laid it out. In religion, a, a little girl sins. She says, oh, I'm going to be in such trouble with my father. That's in religion. But in relationship, when you fall, the same girl that's in relationship with the father, she says, oh, I'm in trouble. I need to run to the father. See the difference? Religion will make you hide from the father. But in relationship, even though you've messed up, you run to the father. Come to the Father. Go and spend time in His presence. Go and enjoy His presence. In His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. He's going to give you a word to encourage you. He will never punish you. Come on, all the punishment was placed on Jesus, the Son at the cross. Why would you then go and hide from the presence of your Father in heaven? He's a good, good Father. Do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure. I love that about Him. To give you the kingdom. His kingdom given to you and I, it was his good pleasure so that you can live out of a kingdom that makes you unstoppable, uncursable, gives you a boldness, gives you a courage, gives you a belief system. You're the righteousness of God. You can hear his voice. You go into his presence. You worship him. You magnify him. You know that Jesus came to give you one thing only, the revelation of God, the Father. Hallelujah. So you start stepping into, into this place where your father can mature you. Because what's he after? He's after your inheritance. Have a look at Hebrews 5 and verse 12. Please type this out. I just let somebody needs to know this. At the very least, God is a blesser. Your father in heaven. If you see him as critical, somebody gave you the wrong message. If you see him as judgmental, you, if you see him as somebody that's out to hurt you, to harm you, to, to find out your sin, You've got the wrong relationship with God. You, and, and this is the problem with most men, is that they struggle with, we struggle with so many different things. But you need to be able to establish your relationship with the Father. And that you don't hide from Him. You rather run to Him. And you want babies. You cannot be a father until you've been made His son. How are you going to function and treat your children with the right value system? Know when to discipline them, know when to hug them, know when to love them, know when to, to, to put things straight. Because you become a responsible father. This is your father in heaven. That's why hallowed be thy name. You stay in that place. He's my father. And if he needs to correct me, he needs to correct me. Let's have a look at Hebrews 5 and verse 12. For, but for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Now you know that those are the babies. But you're now maturing in your prayer walk. You begin to call on God. You begin to call upon and, and work with the anointing and manage the father's estate. And you're not the prodigal running in and out of sin. You're learning how to pray. God's teaching you. You're not you off milk. That's what he did with the prodigal when he came home. He says, take this boy off milk. 
because uh, inherent juveniles can never handle inheritances. You've got to mature this boy. That's why they, they, they slaughtered the, the fatted calf. Why? Because meat is for the mature. That's what it's telling you. It says you, you need to come, you need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who of reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you see, meat is for the matured. It's righteousness. When you begin a, what we've been giving you is meat. You're developing your spirit. You're feeding your spirit with the meat of God's word. It's not just milk anymore. You're breaking from this baby talk. You're breaking from the fact of that you know you blame everybody and blame God for things that are wicked and evil. You don't do that when you're praying the Our Father. He's your father. You know he's a good, good father. So you're maturing. You're maturing with the meat of God's word. You're developing in the in the kingdom of God. You're experiencing the power of God's word. You're experiencing his goodness and he, he can correct you so you've got hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 now look at hebrews 12 and verse 5 have a look at this and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons here, here we go now we're developing you as a son and you are on the meat, you are you, you're developing in righteousness, you're praying the Our Father, you're spending time in His presence, and you're not just asking for a car and a, a cell phone and, and crying and walking away from His presence. No, 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 no. Sons have, have fellowship with the Father. You can go into His presence and He can correct you. And He can say, son, this is not right. He says, my son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves he chastens this is so self explanatory listen how powerful this is and scourges every son whom he receives so that when you come in as a son of God God tells you that he's going to scourge you he's going to remove the things from your life that's destroying your life or has the potential to do so that he's going to begin to speak to you and say you can't speak that way you can't treat people that way no close that computer no go and make right no way go and forgive no go and go and serve in the church no go and stay submitted he's gonna deal with you as a son the babies don't get this this is sonship conversation he says um, if you endure chastening, if you can go through the process and listen to me when we speak about chastening we're not talking about God putting sickness and disease on you what kind of a father would punish you by cutting a limb off or making sure you have an accident? No father will do that. No God and righteous father would do that. Your father doesn't punish you with those things. He disciplines your spirit. There's a grieving that takes place inside of you that says there's something's not right. I don't like this thing. Lord, I need to hear you. I stay, he says, he's cleansing you from the things that's hindering you from becoming what God, your father has intended you to be. He wants to move you into where you can command the heavens. But he needs to deal with you because you are a son. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Has your father never disciplined you? Huh? But if you are without chastening, if nobody's corrected you, think of this bester and young man that has been doing his own thing without a father. Nobody's taken him to the word. Nobody's corrected him. Nobody told him that he can't steal those things. You can't do that. What kind of a son are you that nobody corrects you? In the house of God, from your, how you treat your wife, how you pray. I mean, you can't call yourself a son. He says, but if you're without chastening, of which all have become part partakers. Listen to what I'm saying. This is the scripture saying. You're not the only one being chastened. We're all partakers. <laughs> We're all getting, getting God fixing things in our lives. Nobody comes in here perfect. He says, if, if nobody's correcting you, you are illegitimate. That means you belong to another kingdom and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? So what's he called? He's called the father of spirits. So your spirit becomes grieved. You've got to get used to that when you're finding out, I grieve God. This is not the will of God. I know I thought it was, but my flesh got in the way. I, can, I need to fix it before my father. Because what's, what is your father in heaven doing? The, the father of spirits brings you life. 
He says, For they indeed, your own father, for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but ye for our profit. Every time you come now, you see your son of God, it's for your profit when he disciplines you. He says, Son, go and make right. Son, go and submit. Because what's God? He's looking at your wife. He's looking at your children. He's looking at your future business. He's looking at the future temp temptations. He doesn't want you to be an accident in life. He never created you for trouble, man. He created you for triumph. So when he's correcting you, it's for your future. But he for our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Righteousness is your DNA. Holiness is your conduct. conduct. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it heals the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. I get used to God saying, son, go and repent. Make that thing right. Forgive. Let go of the offense. No, fix those things. Make those things right. Because you, when God is addressing your spirit, it's so that you can live in the spirit because he's your father who is in heaven. And you, when you honor him that way, hallowed be thy name. Let's go to... The reason why you need to see God as your father. The number one reason. Everybody goes through trouble. In fact, you're either going into trouble, you're in trouble, or you're coming out of trouble. And I've watched the people that have got no revelation of the father and no relationship can never endure trouble. All they want to do is get out. All they want to do is get out. Get out. Let's go to the scriptures when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 26, 36. Because you, if you're ever going to come into your destiny, you will always meet with a place called Gethsemane, the place of pressing. And if you have no relationship with the Father at this point, at this juncture, you will never go through. Let me show you why. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he came to this place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there my God. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. I'm going through a thing and I don't know how I'm going to come out of this thing right now but I know the one thing, I have a relationship with my father. So he says, stay here and watch with me. He went a little further. So where does Jesus go? The outer court, the holy place, the most holy place. Watch the three stages of his prayer. Because he's pressing into what? The Father. Your prayer life is going to lead you to a place. In fact, not just your prayer. Your whole walk with God is going to lead you to a place of where you need to break through certain places. And if you do not have the right relationship with God, you're going to look to other people. You're going to depend on, you're going you're to blame pastors. You're going to blame your family where God has taken you alone. Gethsemane is the place of you being alone. He walks from the outer court. He leaves some behind. He goes to the holy place. He leaves some behind. And then he goes. He says, keep praying for me. But I need to have a relationship with the Father. I need to meet with him. He went a little further and fell on his face and praying said, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let the cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me, for, with, one hour, uh, with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. There, I just told you that. Temptation it increases the more, the less prayer you put out. The spirit is indeed willing, but, my, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass, away from me unless I drink it your will be done and he came and he found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy so he left them went away again and prayed the third time saying to the same words then he came to the disciples and said to them are you still sleeping and resting behold the hours at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners rise let's go up see my betrayers at hand can you see that there was no pastor there can you see John the Baptist wasn't there? Can you see Mother Mary, his, his mother Mary wasn't there? Can you see all the people that, the, 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 the 5,000 that he fed? Nobody was there. Because in Gethsemane hours, it's only you and the Father. And there's days when the Father will not give you an answer about certain things. But you know it's his will for you to go through. I mean, we know now that it was only three days later that he was raised from the dead. It's a new season. Why do people never break through into what they have for, for, for their lives because there's certain times you come to a gate 
And the only person that you have at that gate is you and your father and your prayer relationship with him in, that is in heaven. And if you have that in order, you know that the others would be sleeping. You know that the friends aren't there for you. But God, your father, is there for you. And you can break through that moment and become what God has called you to be. I've seen it. People left us. And, and you know, if you get into offense and blaming people, you're missing what the father's doing for you. And I'm watching people that have got no relationship with the father, unable to go to the next level. Because it looks like it's all over. Yet it's not. Because if you can endure the pressing and you can go through the place of the olives where the olives have been pressed and crushed, you're going to find a fresh anointing and a fresh power of God in your prayer because you go from the outer court to the holy place and to the most holy place. But it's only you and the Father. That's why you must have a relationship with the Father in heaven. And that's why you must know that he's a good, good Father. That's why Jesus on the cross could say, Father, into your hand. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And into your hand I commend my spirit. It was him and the father. He had a revelation of the father. He honored the father. He worked with the, the, the plan of the father. In fact, even right straight after that, here comes uh, the, the, the betrayer. Judas kisses him. And of course, you know, Peter goes and cuts the ear off of one of the, the soldiers that came. He says, listen, man. He puts his hand in, and, and he says, and he struck the servant to the high priest and cut off his ear. I'm, I think I'm in verse 50 or so. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? When you have a confidence of the father, your relationship with him, and you know that he's a good, good father, you can go through your garden of Gethsemane moments, and you can experience the power of God, and the anointing will increase upon your life, and you become what God has called you to be. And you will not hang around like an orphan. You will go in and receive your inheritance and become all that God has called you to be. Do you not know that I'm on assignment? In fact, when they came, he said, well, don't you know I can kill you? He says, you can't kill me. I, I, you can't take my life. I've come to lay my life down. That means you can't even go to, uh, you can't even die before your time because of your relationship with your father. When your assignment is up, you can go home. But you need to know that when you have the revelation and you say, hallowed be thy name, you are living under a name of protection provision, peace, joy, victory, because you have a relationship with your heavenly father. My God, my God. <sighs> okay, let me pray for you. David, when they took Goliath's head off, when he did, they asked, who's your father? You are here to represent your father in heaven. And you were supposed to lift up his holy name. You were supposed to be the one when people see the exploits. When they see the things that you do for the kingdom of God. You should be able to say, here's my documented record of what God has done for me. Let me show you about a good, good father. Hallowed be thy name. You stay in this place. You build your relationship with your heavenly father. You begin to let the, his desires come on the inside of you. You honor him. We are here to honor the king and to advance his kingdom. And whatever exploits you have, it is the people who know their God. They'll be strong and do great exploits. Every exploit is for the credit and for the glory of our father in heaven. Because by this our father is glorified that you produce and uh, bear much fruit. The Lord bless you and strengthen you. Know today that you belong to a family and you do have a father. And his name must be glorified in all of your doings. You will never bring disrepute to him. You will never walk in sh let, uh, bring shame to his name because he's going to lead you into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You are here representing your father as you elevate his name and begin to understand the importance of his name. You're going to represent him well. And every exploit and every breakthrough and every miracle and every answer goes to the credit of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, we just thank you so much for the anointing, your grace, and your favor. You are our Father. 
I come against that spirit, that orphan spirit. I come against that spirit of rejection and abandonment that's been in the heart and mind of anybody under the sound of my voice. Father, give the revelation of who you are, your loving kindness, your peace, your joy, and the strength of being covered by you, that no one would feel left out, but that we belong to our Father in heaven and we can become all that you've created us to be. That in the midst of Gethsemane times, we can press, press in and push through because we know that our fathers our father is watching over us and i thank you for the victories for everyone's life in jesus mighty name amen and amen well we love you god bless you i think it's important in your discussion before the lord that you begin to deal with that orphan spirit inside of you do you feel abandoned do you feel rejected do you feel ashamed to be in his presence are you operating like the first adam and not the last adam the last Adam had no issues between me and his father, and so are you. You are born again from the last Adam, and you are adopted, and you belong to the kingdom of God. And God the creator, the king of kings, he is your father. This is Kingdom Keys. I'm Apostle Max. God bless you, and until next time, keep unlocking those mysteries for the kingdom of God. Amen and amen. Thank you.